hello nudgers i hope you're having a lovely day and i wish wish i could be with you but i can't i'm in the caribbean and you know well I'll take you one for the for the team um i want to talk about uh, creativity because i know you're all interested in that and that's encouraging because one of the things that astounds me about creativity is that outside the business community it's hardly spoken about and yet it seems to me extraordinarily important um, to be personal for a moment I produced a little book on creativity and it's a little one it can be read in under an hour and the reason that it's short is that I had the time the thinking time to make it short I'm referring to Mark Twain's remark about, I'm sorry, this letter is such a long one. I didn't have time to write a short one because I deliberately in this book cut out everything that I thought was not important. For example, a lot of people who write about creativity uh, are very, very clever, much smarter than I am, but they're not actually creative themselves. So they include information like, you're more likely to be creative if you moved around a lot in your youth, which is interesting, but unless you can move backwards in time, it's not exactly useful. So um, I'd like to explain how I came to my ideas on creativity because I did uh, science at school. My A-levels were in science. I got into Cambridge on science. When I got to Cambridge, I discovered that the students coming to Cambridge to study science were actually interested in it. And I thought this gave them a very unfair advantage. So I went to my tutor and said, oh, what else can I do? And he said, economics or law. So I thought, well, not the dismal science, certainly. So, so I became a lawyer. And the point of that is that science and law are, are pretty uh, left hemisphere subjects. They're about learning stuff and learning rules and applying rules and logic and deduction and all that kind of thinking. So I had no idea uh, that I had any creative ability at all. If anyone had asked me, I would have said no, because no teacher had ever said to me. I mean, it's interesting because when I was at school at Clifton College, um, the English teacher asked us to write an essay on time. And I knew that that was not easy. So I wrote the whole uh, essay about the fact that I'd not had time to write the essay, which I thought was, you know, it was quite clever. And I look back at it, but the teacher simply said to me, no, please, this isn't a proper essay. And I think that's a wonderful example of how creativity is kind of slowly sucked out of us during the educational process, not by anyone saying you're a bad person or that is a very bad thing to do, but just people saying, no, that's not it. That's not what we're interested in. Because when I got to Cambridge and I joined the Footlights, I suddenly discovered that if I was given a blank sheet of paper, I could write, uh, write something that make people laugh. And this was a bit of a discovery to me. I didn't know I could do anything creative because I was hopeless at, for example, uh, music, utterly unmusical and um, very little, uh, not very good at painting or anything like that. So uh, what happened was when I realized I was doing, my mind was doing things it hadn't done before, I got more interested than I would have done if people had been saying to me all through my childhood, well, you're, a, you're, you're a creative. For example, I used to write sketches at that time, often with Graham Chapman. But if I wrote a sketch on my own, and I always had the problem of the punchline, um, I would spend uh, an hour, an hour and a half at night um, after I'd written the sketch, just trying to think of a good ending. And I go to bed um, beaten and wake up in the morning, make a cup of coffee, sit down at my desk, and within two minutes, I would have the answer. And this happened regularly. And I thought, well, it can't just be coincidence. It happens so often. My mind must be continuing to work on the problem uh, while I'm asleep. And then I wrote a script with Graham and lost it, which I 
always do. I'm very absent. I'm an absent-minded professor without the academic brain. The absent-mindedness is very, very strong, though, and it runs in my family, as my daughter will tell you. So um, uh, I thought, well, I, Graham would be cross with me for losing it, so I'm going to write it out again from memory. And I wrote it out from memory, and then I discovered the original. So I compared them, and the second one I'd written out from memory was quite a lot better. It was sort of neater and clearer and smarter and I thought well I wasn't trying to make it smarter and I thought well maybe my brain was working on it when I didn't even know I was thinking about it and this kind of thing went on and on and on then I bought a book um, published in the 19th century. I bought it in the market stall at Cambridge and, and it said there were several stages in, in um, the creativity, very simple. They said it is preparation, which is doing all the necessary thinking. Um, you know, if it's an ordinary everyday task, you get all the facts you can about it. And if you're a, a scientist, well, then you spend 20 years or a mathematician learning the basics so that you can actually make improvements on them. You've got to do the preparation. And then there's a period that this book called Incubation, like the dear old hens sitting on their eggs and not really doing anything else. And then there's inspiration, which comes not when you're sitting at the desk normally, but when you're taking the dog for a walk or when you're um, having a shower. Or yesterday I got the ending to one particular scene. I'm doing a stage version of Life of Brian, uh, standing in the shallow end of the pool. Oh, I suddenly got it. So. This, this, this fascinated me, and I was lucky enough to know a professor at, um, at Brighton, University of Sussex, called Brian Bates, and he told me about a bit of research that had been done in the 70s um, by a man at Berkeley, Berkeley called McMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcMcM
most of us kind of like to finish things off. You know, if there's two words in a, in a, a crossword we can't do, you know, they sort of bug us. We want to finish it and not just leave it and come back to it later. And that's, that's um, okay. Um, but if you are made anxious, then you want to get rid of the anxiety. And that's why people rush decisions, you see. It's like they can't stand the uncertainty. And the creative architects were very good at saying, well, I have sorted it out yet. I'm very confused. Oh, well, it'll come. But the most important thing was the fact that you don't, uh, you don't solve, you don't get breakthroughs, you don't get brand new ideas from logic. Because if you could, then very, very smart intellectual logical people could be very creative, but a lot of them aren't, not at all, because they don't know how to play. And playing is the way that you get in touch with your unconscious. You see, I don't think we understand how powerful our unconscious is. It's extraordinary capacities, but it's very disobedient. It won't be ordered around. So the thing is, how do we use it uh, or trick it into helping us without sort of trying to hit it with a stick? I'll give you a, a very simple example of this. Uh, psychologists got some people in and they showed them um, Chinese ideograms. And uh, then they came back the next week and they said, we're going to show you some ideograms again. Uh, some you saw last week and some you didn't. Will you tell us, please, which ones you saw last week? And the results were hopeless. Hopeless. Not surprising, really, but no better than chance. Absolutely hopeless. So they then ran the experiment again the first week they showed them Chinese ideograms. And the second week when they came back, they said, we're going to show you some ideograms, some you've seen before, some you haven't. We just want you to tell us which ones you kind of like. You just look at some and you think, ah, I like the shape of that one. I don't like that one so much. Oh, I like that one. Yes, I like that one. Ooh, I don't like that one. And what they discovered was the ones they liked were the ones they'd seen the previous week. Now that is extraordinary. The unconscious, in a way, could recognize them, but he couldn't say, I recognize that. He could only say, oh, I like that better. The greatest expert on Renaissance, uh, Renaissance art, Bernard Berenson, could always tell if someone or something was a fake. He was famous. He could always spot if it was a fake. But the reason that he used to know it was a fake is that he started to feel ill. It was his feelings who were telling him what he wanted to know, not his thoughts, you see. And that's what we've got to understand about feelings. There's another experiment in Chicago, the Institute of Chicago and the museum there. They got a lot of people together and they said, we want all these objects up here on this big table. Come and draw, draw um, a, a, a still life. So some of the people went up there and chose them quite quickly and came back and arranged them and drew it. And other people went up there and chose them, but they sort of threw them in the air and sniffed them and did all this to them and said, uh, I don't think I like that one. I like this one. In other words, guided entirely by feeling, not by logic. They chose them and then they come back and they make an arrangement and they look at it and they think, no, I don't like that. No, that isn't right either. I don't like that. Hmm, I'm going to change that one. So he takes one back and he comes and brings another one. Ah, oh, that's better. I like that better. And then, then, then they started to draw and they draw it and then throw it away and draw it again. And then I finally come up with something. And when they compared the two, the people who'd taken all this time and felt their way out were people earning livings as creative artists. And the people who'd done it quickly and got it out of the way and been very efficient weren't in the arts or any kind of creative life at all. It was all to do with feeling. Do we feel good about it? So the most important thing is, how do we get in touch with these feelings? The answer is, we're not going to get in touch with these feelings if we um, are rushing around uh, checking our watches and taking phone calls and ticking things off on lists because that's the mind's too busy. You can't get in touch with subtle feelings or subtle thoughts or images if you're racing around being too busy. So the way to get in touch with your unconscious is to create what I call um, 
a space. The thing is, it's a space. A space is you have to have boundaries of, of, of space and boundaries of time. In the beginning, the reason you have to have boundaries of space, you don't want people interrupting you. The most devastatingly destructive thing when you're trying to think it creatively is interruptions. They are they are death to creativity. That's why open plan offices are such a disaster, especially for introverts, but for everyone, because you get, cannot follow a train of thought if people are interrupting you. So you have to have boundaries. If you're at the top of the organization, you say to your secretary, please, sorry, personal assistant, I must insult them. Uh, please, uh, I, I don't want to be interrupted for an hour, an hour and a half. Close the door, you've got to spend. Next thing is time. You've got to have sufficient time, and I'll explain why, but you want to start at this time and at that time, because there's a great book called Homo Ludens, Playing Man by a Dutch philosopher, historian called Huizinga, and he said something which is incredibly important to me. He said, play has got to be separate from ordinary life. So you have to have a rigid starting moment and a rigid finishing moment. And that's how you can then focus complete. It's a bit like a game of football. You blow the whistle and you start. You have 90 minutes and somebody blows the whistle and then you go back to everyday rules. But during that time, the rules of football apply and people are not allowed to interrupt to come on the pitch, you see? So you create this space of time and this space of by boundaries of space. And then you sit there and you just play. And the first thing you think is, oh, I should have called Bob. And it's like meditation. All you get in the first few minutes is stuff. I should have bought the cat's present. I forgot so-and-so's birthday, all that stuff. But as you sit there, like the Buddhists say, a cloudy glass of water, the cloudiness starts to settle. It might take 10 or 15 minutes, but that's where you've got to allow that at the very beginning before you ever get into the the more contemplative and meditative bit of it all, when you just start playing with ideas without worrying about things from everyday life. You let those worries settle, then you can just play. And you mustn't expect to get results because some days things will come and some days they won't. It's the first thing I discovered when I was writing with Graham was that some days it just flowed and other days it didn't. Um, and, and when Graham and I would sort of break, be, beat each other up and beat ourselves up for not being any good at writing, well, well, I, I came to see it was because somebody told me about Gregory Bateson who said you can't have a new idea till you got rid of an old one. And I see those periods when nothing is happening. Now, as a time when you're just sort of sorting things out and creating a space for the new idea to get in. So you mustn't start worrying, oh, it's not coming today. Some days it'll come, some days it won't. But the days that it isn't coming are preparing yourself for the days when it does come. So you mustn't worry about that kind of stuff. You must just sit there and play. Now, there's one other stage I need to talk about and it's not creative, which is why I haven't talked about it much. And that is that when you're satisfied that you know what this creative idea is, and it may have taken you several sessions to clarify it in your own mind, because at the beginning, it's just an image, you see. The unconscious doesn't give you neat little messages that printed out saying the answer is X. The unconscious will make you think of an elephant or a piece of music you heard once or something like that. It's a very, very, very subtle stuff, which is why you need to be so, 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 so calm. But once you've, you've got a bit of an idea and you've thought about it and built it and built it, and it gets clearer as you build it more, that's the moment when at some point you have to say, all right, now I have to assess whether this is any good. And then you go back to your ordinary way of thinking, the way that we've all been educated to think, which is rational and logical and, and, and articulate, very much to do with words and, and analytical, but essentially critical, so that you can decide whether this new idea of yours is actually any good or not. But there's one very important thing is, if you start getting critical too soon, you're going to kill the creativity. I always say that creative ideas are like, are like newborn babies. They're easily strangled. 
And that's why I feel sorry for people who studied um, English at university because they'll start writing a story and they'll immediately think, oh, oh no, that's a bit Graham Greene, that is, and then it's write something else and they think, oh no, that's a, that's a bit a scarlet and a black, um, and then write something else. And, oh, good, no, that's more Somerset, more. You know, uh, so you've got to get that critical thinking out of the way because you do not know at any moment whether an idea is good or bad until you've followed it through. See, well, where does that lead me? Where, oh, oh, over there, or over there. So there's no such thing when you're being creative. There's no such thing as a mistake. It's all grist to the mill. If you're working with someone, you may say something, where you misunderstand and then come up with a great idea as a result of so there's nothing wrong when you're being creative you just play and play and play and it's lovely it's the bit that i enjoy most in the in the whole of writing so i think that that basically is summing it up and the problem is it's countercultural, which is why i'm glad i've had a chance to talk at 20 minutes because i can't just tell people things i have to sort of I have to try and explain to them that it's quite different from what you've been told at school, which is sitting there with a furrowed brow beating your brain. There's nothing to do with that. And that kind of thinking is fine for maths problems or anything where you know all the factors and you know all the measurements. But when there's anything else that's much vaguer than this kind of thinking where you allow the unconscious to throw up things, it's like people, you get a feeling sometimes when you're with someone, I just don't like this person. I just don't trust them. And the answer is, go with it. Stay, say the distance. You're, you're, you're unconscious with this huge memory is, is picking up something about this person and, and making you feel, oops, no, back off, back off a bit. And it's that kind of feeling of a positive nature that tells you whether you're heading towards a good idea or not. So um, play play you don't know where you're going as einstein once said uh, if when you're doing research you know what you're going to come up with it's not research <laughs> and that's the problem we're dealing with executives because they want to know what they're getting before you have any chance to know what they're going to be getting so you have to say to them well you're getting me and if you don't trust me fire me there's this very strange bias I've noticed in the business world, which is all creative people have to present their ideas for assessment and evaluation by highly rational left brain people. And probably that's OK, to be absolutely honest. I don't think you want the people who check the wheel nuts on planes to be wildly experimental people all the time. But the weird thing is it never happens the other way around. So if you've got a bunch of accountants in a room, they will come to a conclusion based on their own particular formulation. And they'll never suggest just throwing it out to some wacky people to see if there are alternative solutions. So there's this kind of asymmetry that, and I think it's very similar to Ian McGilchrist's point that, you know, to some extent, the left brain has taken over and assumed a kind of dominance which it doesn't deserve. Would you say that's broadly speaking fair? It's the, the biggest single thing I got from Ian McGilchrist has solved, solved something I've been worried about for years is uh, the superiority of critics. <clears throat> now, you know, Oscar Wilde said about critics, they're like eunuchs. They watch it every night, but they can't do it themselves. And I like that joke. But it, made, it, it masks a very important thing, is that most critics can't uh, write good plays or comedies, and most of them can't direct them, and most of them can't act them. And yet they are put in judgment over people who can. The more you think about it, the more strange it is. No, it's not that they don't have useful things to say, but if an actor wants a little bit of help about how to get a laugh, he'd rather have me to help him than a theater critic. Do you see what I mean? In other words, there's a certain kind of know-how that performers have that I think critics don't understand at all. Critics very, very frequently, for example, reward or praise acting that's easy and don't understand that some acting that looks easy isn't. So why do the people who are critical always seem to be in a superior position? And uh, McGilchrist uh, points out that the left hemisphere always wants to dominate. 
And that in our society now, we almost take it for granted that anybody who can say something very articulately and back it with numbers is going to be more persuasive than someone who can just do it well. One of the bizarre things is it seems evident to me that the world contains quite a lot of hidden intelligence, particularly in old things, and there's quite a lot of hidden stupidity. Yes. Um, and patently, I was just writing about this because you mentioned the open plan office. And one of the problems with the open plan office is it doesn't provide you with any variety of um, pace or space. So you're more or less in the same setting for five days a week. Now, technology has made this worse as well, because it used to be that where you are constrained what you did. So if you locked yourself away in a room, you were secluded. And if you were in a pub, you were sociable. And now you have the mobile phone, which means you lock yourself away in a room, but suddenly you're talking to people. You know, it used to be in the photocopier room, you photocopied in a meeting room, you met where you were, focused what you did. And of course, technology has broken that down, but also the open plan office breaks down the variety, which is sometimes you want to be in a quiet space or a cafe, and sometimes you want to be in somewhere much busier. Mm. And it always struck me that religion understood this. It had things like Lent or Ramadan, or you had festivals like Christmas, which accepted the fact that people were fundamentally happier if you injected a bit of variety into life. Whereas the efficiency doctrine basically assumes that what's best practice on Monday has to be best practice on Tuesday and best practice on Wednesday. Yeah. And it creates a kind of uniformity, which I think is quite dangerous um, because ev everything is kind of optimized essentially, and then at a, and Adam Smith spotted this, that essentially the division of labor led to very boring jobs. And it does worry me because there's a great paper written by a guy called Paul Graham, who's the founder of Y Combinate. It's very similar to what you said about the need to essentially block off large periods of uninterrupted time in order to do anything worthwhile creatively. And he, he the paper's actually called, it's one sheet of A4. It's like your book, it's beautifully brief and it's called maker time versus manager time and he makes the point that if you're a maker if you put a little 20 minute meeting in the middle of someone's afternoon to a manager that's a perfectly logical thing to do because it's just 20 minutes of your time to the maker it destroys their whole afternoon so that single interruption of 20 minutes in the space of four hours now means that they can't do anything of real significance and this business i think one of the one of the opportunities we have in flexible working is to repartition time so that, you know, maybe Wednesdays are highly sociable and Fridays are secluded. But I noticed writing a book that actually, if you blocked, blocked out three days to write a book, the, the relationship between time and productivity was completely nonlinear. OK, and that day one, you wrote nothing. Day two, you wrote a little. And day three, you produced 8000 words. Right. And I realized that this that this question of actually having uh, unpolluted time devoted to one thing only, but with those little breaks where I think you mentioned the wonderful thing, I think, about in your book, uh, which is that Edison found the um, the moment when he was kind of half awake, half asleep was particularly rich creatively. And he used to doze off with a, a basically a fist full of ball bearings. That's so right. that as soon as he fell asleep, they'd fall to the floor and wake him up again. There was a metal plate down there so that they would clang when they uh, clang. <laughs> wake him up and then he'd pick up the balls and then go back to the same state between sleep and, you know, and that's the opposite of all the clarity and, and uh, what's the word, articulateness that people think is the essence of thought. It is for some things. It's great for maths problems. You don't need the unconscious for maths problems. But when there's areas... Well, of... Mathematicians, some mathematicians would disagree. They'd say that actually, yeah... No, but what I'm talking about is that the yeah. ordinary mm. don't need it. You know, I, I agree with you. There's great creativity. And mathemat mathematicians, when they have two equal theories, they like the one that's more beautiful to them. You mm. see? That's just about feeling. That's mathematicians. So at the very top, but you've got to really reach the top before you can start being creative in, 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 in mathematics. So the ordinary one, which is an engine leaves leads and an engine leaves what, what time do they crash, that you don't have to go into your unconscious for that because you've got everything you need to know. You've got the factors and you've got the measurements. 
You see what I mean? But it's when, if you, when you say, how do I get this group of people to work better together? That's not a logical problem. That's something you have to do by picking up your people skills, which comes from your gut. So the language, the language, to borrow the language of sex therapy, we've got a problem with a kind of premature rationalization, essentially, <laughs> in that, yeah, uh, in that people leap to reason, because I've always been conscious of the fact that this is true in science. It's a rather beautiful description by Donald McKinnon, by the way, when he described the most creative scientists and architects were like sedate businessmen. So they had a mentality of a business person, but they were just a bit more chilled and relaxed and less impatient about doing what they did. Which is a lovely McKinnon phrase. It's not the wacky creative artist who's completely undisciplined, but the relationship to time is just fundamentally different. Mm, that's very good. Because when children are playing, they have no sense of time. No sense of time. Mistakes. So you don't say to a children, oh, "Children, you're not playing properly." <laughs> you know, you got to have that freedom. I agree. And when when you were talking about um, uh, not knowing whether it's going to come or not, what Graham and I figured out after a certain time is that we had a weekly average. That that although we didn't know how much we produce on any given day, what we knew is we work basically ten to five thirty five days a week. We'll produce between fifteen and seventeen minutes of good material, and it'll come quite unevenly. But it was the fact that it, that the average was predictable used to make us relax when the things weren't coming. And you never tried to bring McKinsey in to actually improve that productivity rate. You felt that productivity rate was essentially just innate in the process yes you yeah. couldn't control it and uh, it's like thinking when you're eating that the good bit is when the food is approaching you on the fork and the, the, when when you've eaten it off the fork and the fork has to go back to the plate that there's something wrong with that time you should be using it better of course it's intrinsic to the process of eating which yeah. is return fork to plate yeah now i think I think this is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, one thing that I've always, I mean, one thing that's always taught me the importance also of the overnight test and yeah. simply going away and distracting yourself is I'm, I'm just a cryptic crosswords fan. Ah. And it's, I don't know if you're, it's apologies to Americans in the audience because they don't really have them. They, the nation, I think, has one, but it's very rare. But it's an extraordinary thing where you can look at the same crossword completely bemused or the same clue yes, completely yes. bemused. And then you come back to it after some period of self-distraction and the answer is absolutely self-evident. Well, you see, I think you mentioned at some time there was great wisdom in the past. You see, my parents' generation would say, let's, let's sleep on that. Yeah. And I don't think young people say that. In other words, we're aware that if you just let it go for a few hours and had some sleep and woke up in the morning and then come back to it again, they knew that something would happen. They couldn't put it in terms of unconscious, perhaps. They knew that somehow it worked. Whereas young people think that speed is essential for intelligence. If people are smart, it's because they're quick, not because they sit for a long time and then come up with something very, very smart indeed. And I think one of the great faults of, of American businessmen is that they need to be decisive and they think decisive means making decisions quickly. No, it's making decisions when they have to be made. So, yeah, the interesting thing I wrote about this recently, which is what we actually want is more uncertainty, but more boldness. But yeah. we've created an environment which rewards certainty and cowardice yes. rather than uncertainty and courage. Very good. I love this uh, guy, Richard Feynman, who said, uh, yeah. the wording won't be quite right. He said, I would rather live in a state of pleasant uncertainty than pretend that I'm sure about things which I know perfectly well I can't be sure about. Gorgeous. That's a fantastic place to end. Uh, I also love his point where he says, this is how you come up with a theory and uh, a, 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 a new scientific finding. He says, first of all, you guess. And of course, everybody bursts out laughing and he goes and defends it and says, no, 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 this is absolutely how it works. Everything starts with a guess. A guess. It's something from the unconscious. And then you, you know, if, it, if the guess doesn't live up to evidence, if it conflicts with experiment, then your guess is wrong. That's it. And uh, brilliant point, you know, that actually everything starts with some degree of speculation. Yeah, yeah. 
I, yes, he, he said a couple of things like that. Um, he, he said that uh, he says the moment when a, a, a great new idea is not when somebody shouts Eureka, it's when somebody says, That's odd. Perfect. Wonderful. So that's a great distinction. I think biology, as someone said, is a science of exceptions, not a science of laws. And actually, the anomaly is the actually which most people try and freeze out of the equation because it's annoying. The anomaly is really where the news comes from. Yes, that's right. Because if Alexander Fleming had looked at that particular Petri dish and thought, oh, that one hasn't grown properly, throw it away. <laughs> right? Uh, the, do you know the actual thing? He was actually supposed to be at home on holiday and had come into London grudgingly uh -huh. on a, 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 and was heading back to his cottage somewhere in Suffolk and nearly chucked them all in the bin. Yes. So we were about 20 seconds away from that, I think. That's it. And, and it's, it's very sad because life is much more interesting if you get rid of, certain, uh, get rid of certainty. And yeah. I think one of, the, one of the characteristics of people who get rid of certainty is they tend to be literal minded because they think that that gives them a feeling of greater greater certainty. And of course, the idea that Christ's teachings should be uh, interpreted literally is a bit funny when you consider that he taught in parables. <laughs> <laughs> Beautifully fun. You know, what a perfect way. That's actually a perfect way to end.